uh, if everybody's quite ready with their salutations to each other, uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion 17892 in the name of Kevin Stewart on working group on tenement maintenance. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Kevin Stewart to speak to and move the motion. Minister, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome the publication earlier this month of the final recommendations report of the working group on tenement maintenance. Uh, and I commend members of the group for bringing, bringing together MSPs uh, from all parties and a wide range of stakeholder interests. Um, as convener, uh, Graham Simpson has led the work on bringing the report and its recommendations to publication. Uh, I also commend his predecessor uh, as convener, Ben McPherson, uh, for the initial work in bringing the group together and getting it started. Uh, the consensus that has been achieved is reflected in this motion, uh, which comes today with the support of all parties in the Parliament. The motion seeks Parliament's agreement that the Working Group's recommendation merit serious and careful consideration. And I fully agree with that. I've previously given my commitment to consider the recommendations, and today I reiterate that commitment, and it is my intention to make a substantive, substantive even, response um, to the report in the autumn. I note the working group's intention to hold a conference to consider the recommendations in September, uh, which the government will support. And I'm sure that the discussion at that event uh, will help us take this matter forward. Presiding officer, many people in Scotland live in tenements, which will continue to provide good quality, safe, sustainable and affordable homes uh, for many years from now. But only if we look after the homes that we live in. Owners of tenements need to accept their responsibility uh, for protecting and preserving them from our older built heritage through to brand new flats. Uh, and they must carry out repairs and maintenance to common parts of their property. The most recent Scottish House Condition Survey Local Authority report estimates that 36% of Scottish homes are in tenements and indicates that disrepair is worse in tenements than in any other kinds of houses. Uh, the report estimates that 66% of houses and 76% of tenements have at least some minor disrepair, which can cover a wide range of defects, and that around 5% of houses and 8% of tenements have extensive disrepair. Regular maintenance is not only a good practice, it's also much more cost effective to invest in regular proactive maintenance than to let small defects grow through neglect into expensive and potentially ruinous repairs. It's fr frustrating for owners uh, who accept these responsibilities and are keen to work with their neighbours to find their efforts hampered by a culture of poor maintenance. And it's also necessary to look after our homes to play our part in tackling the global climate emergency. Uh, we will need more than 80% of the homes that we currently live in to still be in use in 2050. The report recognises that primary legislation will be needed to deliver its recommendations in full, and that time is needed for the development and passage of acts. A, a 10 year timescale is anticipated to implement the recommendations in full. That includes a proposal to commission the Scottish Law Commission to consider the complex interaction of maintenance responsibilities and property law. I will include this point in the response to the report's recommendations that I intend to make in autumn. I completely agree that owners of tenements should plan ahead for future common repairs and maintenance and that they must be prepared to work together and pay their share of the cost of the work. However, as the report notes, it might be difficult to enforce compulsory sinking funds or five yearly inspections. It's not clear what would happen if a flat owner did not have the money to contribute to a sinking fund or refuse to pay. Some homeowners would not welcome uh, the need to hand over sums of money for repairs not actually required at that point. 
This does not mean that the proposals are unworkable. It does mean, however, that there needs to be serious thought about how they could be funded and enforced in practice. And we all need to work together to address these issues. Uh, the motion itself recognises the challenges that must be met to ensure that our housing stock can, can, can continue to provide safe and sustainable homes for the future. Uh, very briefly, Andy Whiteman. Mr. Particular intervention, he highlights some challenges there around sinking funds, for example. Does he accept that around the world there are plenty of examples where such arrangements uh, uh, are in place and operate very smoothly, and that whilst it's a challenge, it's not something that's impossible? Um, I, I've not said that it's impossible, and I think that we need to uh, look at what happens elsewhere uh, in order for us uh, to get this absolutely right. Um, and I will respond in depth and in the autumn around about that. But Mr. Whiteman can be assured that uh, uh, we will not do all of this in isolation and we will look at uh, practice that does take place elsewhere to see if we can uh, perhaps plagiarise some of the good ideas that may exist in, in other places. Um, I'm pleased, President Officer, that this government uh, has done, what, that what this government has done so far is acknowledged. Uh, we've already taken action to improve the condition of Scottish tenements. The report notes, for example, uh, the positive impact of missing shares and equity loans. In my own constituency in Aberdeen, I've seen how missing shares are having a positive Im impact. Often the threat of a missing share is enough to persuade an owner to engage with their neighbours. However, I accept that we need to go further. Energy efficient Scotland will also drive change in Scotland's housing stock. Poor condition is a factor in the difficulties of keeping houses warm and affordable. And we know that a building that lets out heat or lets water in because it's in a poor state of repair is also likely to consume more energy to heat comfortably. And that, of course, leads to higher carbon emissions. And we'll consider how to take these issues forward as part of the programme. The equity loan scheme provides access to funding for some types of maintenance works in conjunction with energy efficient improvements, uh, which could provide a route to funding for tenement owners. And we'll be continuing to monitor the performance of this scheme in the coming uh, months with a wider view to roll that out further. I can also give an undertaking today uh, that the recommendation to link a five yearly report on tenement condition uh, to the Home Report will be looked at as part of the government's response uh, to the recommendations for improving Home Reports. Traditional stone tenements are a distinctive part of Scotland's built heritage uh, and we have added to that with more modern types of flats. Our system of individual property ownership is also distinctive. Uh, as Professor Robertson notes in his recent report on common repairs for the working group, citing an observation from Roman law, communio est mater rixarum, co-ownership is the mother of disputes. And he quotes Hugo Grotius's remark from the 17th century that common ownership could bring nothing but discontent and dissension. Maybe so, uh, but I hope that the report of the working group on tenement maintenance can be a basis for finding a way forward that allows us to improve cooperation between owners, helps us to build a culture of proactive common maintenance and preserves our unique buildings for the benefit of future generations. Presiding officer, I move the motion. Thank you, thank you very much. I now call on Graeme Simpson. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, start with a few thank yous? Um, first of all, can I thank the, uh, the government for giving up uh, its own debating time uh, to debate this issue? Um, can I thank the Minister for Europe, um, Ben McPherson, who was the initial convener uh, of the working group? And can I also thank the fellow MSPs who have been um, an integral part of the group, Andy Whiteman, Daniel Johnson, John Mason, Jeremy Balfour, Maureen Watt, Stuart McMillan, uh, and, and of course, uh, Gordon Lindhurst, who I suspect was the only member who understood the minister's attempt at Latin. <laughs> now, we've had uh, a few uh, debates on this, um, but housing and the condition of housing does not get nearly enough attention uh, in this place, uh, in my view. It affects all of us, and if things go wrong, it can harm people's physical and mental health. 
We've all had cases of buildings in need of repair, damp, insecure, and leaking. And statistics paint a pretty grim picture. Uh, the Minister touched on some of them. We know from the most recent housing condition survey that 68% of homes have some degree of disrepair. Disrepair to critical elements stood at 50%. 28% had some instance of urgent disrepair and 5% had extensive disrepair. These figures have not moved in a year. And nearly a fifth of our housing is pre-1919. That's 467,000 homes and 68% of those of disrepair to critical elements. That's a lot of homes needing a lot of work done to them. We need to look at this uh, as part of the fabric of our nation. Our built heritage is part of our infrastructure. That's the way I think we need to view this. Um, there is a need to act. I mean, there were recent statistics in Edinburgh, for example. There are 20 incidents in this city of falling masonry every month. That's just in Edinburgh, so roll that out across the country and you'll see the scale of the property. But we're not just looking at um, what you might traditionally think of as tenements, as uh, older buildings. Um, there are newer ones as well. I mean, where I live in East Kilbride, um, a lot of the buildings built around the same, same kind of time uh, falling into disrepair. Um, they're not pre-1919. The working group uh, was set up um, and it was a genuinely and is a genuinely cross-party cross group. Um, and that's important because if we're going to tackle this extremely difficult issue, it needs to be done um, with, with the uh, approval of every party uh, in this chamber. Earlier this month, we published our final report with key recommendations, and I'll come on to those. Implementing the changes is not going to be easy, and there will be a cost, but we can't ignore the human cost in terms of health, physical and mental, and well-being of not taking action. So let me have a look at the recommendations. There are three. We believe that tenement properties should be inspected every five years, and a report prepared that will be publicly available to existing or prospective owners, tenants, neighbours and policy makers. The purpose of the report will be to show what condition the building is in, how much it will cost to bring it up to standard if it's defective, and what needs to be done by way of ongoing maintenance. The group also recommended uh, the compulsory establishment of owners' associations. Owners' associations are an essential element of tenement maintenance by providing leadership, effective decision-making processes, and the ability of groups to enter into contracts. Now, if for whatever reason uh, one cannot be established or it fails, then compulsory factoring could, could be the fallback position. And the final recommendation is the establishment of building reserve funds. And there was a lot of discussion over how this would look and how it would operate, and the Minister has uh, uh, rightly touched on some of the challenges around that, but it was decided that a central fund was preferable to an owner's association held fund, a central fund had better protection and it's easier to prevent fraud. Now we know that none of these ideas are simple. It's very, very complex. It could be controversial. A lot of people won't like it, uh, but it needs to be done. The report provides suggestions for further research and actions as well as timelines. It could take, as the minister rightly says, 10 years or more. Uh, for the implementation. There's still a lot to do, but I'm confident we're on the right path. Uh, and I know the Scottish Government takes this seriously. Um, pleased to hear the Minister will be making a statement uh, in the autumn. I look forward to that. Um, we need cross-party support, and that's why the motion has not been amended by anyone. Um, I must give my appreciation for the hard work and effort by the stakeholders in the group, our secretariat, Ewan Leach from the Built Environment Forum Scotland, uh, and RICS, as well as the other organizations and individuals who took part, because without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. In May last year, Parliament voted in favor of a motion which called for a review of legislation on tenements. That hasn't happened yet, but I hope that today's debate will be a catalyst for it, uh, I'm pleased to hear the Minister say 
He'll make that statement and the government will take part in a conference on this because, frankly, Deputy Presiding Officer, doing nothing is not an option. Thank you very much. I call Daniel Johnson to follow by Andy Whiteman. Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, and can I, too, begin by reeling off my list of thanks, first of all, to my fellow members of the Cross-Party Working Group. But it's been genuinely refreshing taking part in a group such as this that's worked in a very constructive way and certainly without any hint of uh, party uh, political partisanship. But can I also thank the government, too, for making this time. This is a, a serious issue, but one that could be easily sort of dismissed uh, as being technical or, or, or not necessarily as important as I certainly believe it is. But I can I also add my thanks to Ewan Leach, who put an absolute power of work and quite frankly, without his input, um, this report would not have been written, uh, literally. And can I also ask, uh, uh, also echo uh, thanks to Ricks, who again, uh, I think, uh, supplied much of the, the wherewithal to make this happen. And, and the, the, there's a simple reason why I think that uh, this is an important bit of work, because tenemented uh, 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 residences, tenemented homes, are absolutely core to, to my constituency. Edinburgh Southern is a part of Scotland who, when you think of the area I represent, you think of places like Marchmont, you think of places like Brunsfield, you think of places like Mar uh, Morningside, places which are absolutely built of tenemented maintenance. And the only way we will maintain such fantastic areas such as those, but also areas that you might not consider tenemented, as we've, uh, as we've heard, ranging from post-war uh, local authority built houses through to subdivided mansions, all of these types of building, that rich um, seam of different types of homes are tenemented uh, homes. So we need to maintain them, not just because they are nice buildings, many of which are, but because they are critical to our country. As uh, Graham Simpson points out, housing is infrastructure. But I think it is actually our most fundamental form of infrastructure because it's the, the very homes which we live and, and housing is so critical. And I think both the, the Minister and Graham ha, have uh, set out some of the, the detail. But let me set out some of the context. But before I do that, can I just acknowledge Andy Whiteman? Because I think he is the one who sort of established that concept of housing being infrastructure, and that is critical. But that while housing is infrastructure, we must also recognise the context which, within which this debate takes place. And that is which, on many counts, I think we are seeing something of a housing crisis. We see a crisis of availability with huge numbers of people in this city uh, 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 having to uh, uh, live in a temporary accommodation far longer than they should have to. Uh, likewise, on affordability, too many people are finding themselves either priced out of the housing market or simply that the housing costs taking up an, a, a disproportionate amount of their uh, 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 wage, but also one of sustainability. And I was glad the minister raised the points about the environmental sustainability of our housing and the need to invest of it in, in, in for those uh, reasons. So these are the reasons why housing is so important. And, and yes, maintenance is critical to maintaining housing for all of these social goods because housing it's what underpins so much of well-being in this country. So I believe that there is a clear public interest in taking forward measures such as these set out in the report. I think it's important that we preserve our housing stock and invest in our housing stock for future generations because it's not just the people that live in the houses right now that benefit from investment. It is future generations that will live in it too, which is why we need a legal recognition of the reality of tenemented housing, which is people do not own individual bits of property that is completely uh, distinguished from other people's property. They are, in effect, co-owners of a single building. That is a fact that is not currently recognised in the law. That needs to change. So that's what this does. But over and above those points, there is a fundamental point of public safety that we need to recognise too. And, and, and Graham Simpson alluded to it. In this city, there are huge numbers of roof falls every single month. Between 2014 and 2018, we have seen an almost quadrupling of roof falls. There were 78 roof falls, including uh, 53 masonry falls in Edinburgh. That rose to 179 masonry falls and a total of 254 falls from roofs in Edinburgh in 2018. That can be lethal and has been lethal in the past. So this isn't simply something that, that is a nice to have, something that will make lives 
a little bit better, although it will. This also is something that can potentially save lives. So I, I, I think the proposals have already been outlined, but we, we need building checks to make sure that the buildings continue to be safe, to be habitable, because preventative spend is much more cost effective than uh, spend when the damage has already set in. We need owners associations so that people have the structure and the entity through which they can make collective decision making reflecting uh, I'll close uh, uh, very shortly. Uh, the no, reality no, you're of going building. to close now. I, 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 no, no, so no. for these reasons, no. I welcome no. these proposals and look forward to Thank the Minister's statement in the autumn. Glad you understand the word now. Uh, call Andy Whiteman, who will be followed by Stuart McMillan. And of course, the open debate speeches are four minutes, Mr McMillan. You will set the precedent, I know. Mr Whiteman. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. And uh, like other members, I also want to thank uh, the Minister for making time for this debate uh, and indeed the Scottish Government for providing um, some critical funding that oiled the wheels of the working behind the scenes of this uh, debate. And also thanks to Ben McPherson, who I see is not here, but he's presumably uh, busy with other things. It was his debate in January 2018, I think, that first made the proposal that we, we established such a cross-party working group. And like Daniel Johnson, uh, I very much enjoyed engaging uh, with it, with grappling with some kind of quite complicated questions, um, but nevertheless, uh, it was very worthwhile. And I want to also thank the wide range of members, including landlords, factors, surveyors and council officials, officials who contributed substantial time and effort in analysing uh, the issues, dis discussing them, researching them and developing papers. And particularly thanks to Ewan Leach from the Built Environment Scotland who had provided the Secretariat. And the fact that this was called a working group I think is important. It actually did some work, uh, some serious work, work on a vitally important uh, area, the governance of tenemental property. And like other members, I'm sure I have a regular stream of constituents with complaints about common repairs and the difficulties of securing ongoing maintenance. And personally, although I do no, lo no longer own a home, uh, I did own a tenement flat until 1996. Uh, and the stress of organising repairs, which included uh, threats of violence against me uh, by my neighbours, um, led me and, and five other residents uh, to selling up. And I know many other folk have faced similar uh, situations. Uh, so when you talk about people's mental health and their physical health um, in relationship to the stresses that can arise as a result of living within an environment that is not appropriately governed, it is, it is real. Um, and none, none of this is a new phenomenon. Of course, in the past, most of the tenements uh, were owned by landlords and occupied by tenants. And so the landlords were responsible. There wasn't such a, such a variety of responsibility. Um, but nevertheless, most of the properties in Glasgow, Edinburgh, have been here for a century, at least, in some cases, more than 200 years. Um, and with proper maintenance and refurbishment, they should last uh, many, many more uh, years. But they've not had that uh, proper uh, maintenance. And although we do have some systems in place and some improvements have been made, as the Minister alluded, um, uh, we still face a very challenging uh, situation. So, in short, Scotland has allowed a major part of its infrastructure to fall into disrepair due to a failure to develop the kind of modern governance arrangements that are uh, prevalent um, in, in most normal European countries. Now, as Graeme Simpson said, um, sorry, I wanted to thank Graeme Simpson as well for convening the cross-party working group. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, the working group made three key recommendations on building inspections, compulsory owners associations, and building reserve funds, and it laid out a proposal timetable for delivering that. Now, as Daniel John Johnson alluded, I've mentioned this before, at the heart of this issue, I think, is the fact that we treat uh, domestic property as an exclusively private interest, despite the fact that a third floor flat will enjoy support from the second floor and shelter from uh, above, and that the, the time spans of, uh, the lifespans of tenements uh, in this city should be measured in centuries. And so in that light, these properties are part of the public infrastructure of our city, just like the streets and the sewers and the utilities. And within this public infrastructure, there are private interests, the owners and occupiers, for the time being. And it's their essentially short-term private interests, uh, typically around 10 years, 20 years maybe at most, that too often prevails and has frustrated, I think, progress in this in the past um, and frustrates uh, the necessity to undertake regular uh, maintenance. So I'd like us to frame this debate clearly as one concerning the public infrastructure of our urban realm rather than private property. And let's also agree that owners have responsibilities as well as rights. These responsibilities need to be laid out well in advance. 
and signposted. And in this regard, it's important we move from the broad agreement of the working group to high-level political agreement to implement them. The proposals set out in this report have cross-party support. We can build on that and agree a programme of work to deliver. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr McMillan. Thank, thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Graham Simpson for, the, for chairing the working group and also Ben McPherson, MSP, beforehand. Uh, I, I generally think that this has been a, a useful exercise, and as others have commented on, I think the title of being a working group was so important in this aspect. I managed to only just get to one of the meetings, but a member of my staff went along uh, on my behalf to others. Uh, in my constituency, uh, Greenock and Inverclyde, I mean, Inverclyde itself has got, in 2017, 48.8% of the Inverclyde homes were considered to be flats. Uh, and obviously incorporating the tenements as well. And, uh, and I've had many constituents come to me with uh, housing issues, uh, and uh, some, I'll touch upon one in a moment. But I, I, for a moment, I do not think that every landlord, or even the majority uh, of landlords, are bad individuals. The vast majority are good, uh, and they do a, a wonderful job. But that small minority, uh, one unfortunately does, uh, and they do give the responsible owners uh, a bad uh, reputation. And, uh, uh, I just think it's. Uh, I think this, the recommendations from this uh, working group, uh, I think, have been are really important to certainly kind of help with the debate going forward. Uh, certainly, one of the things that I, that I generally believe that we need to, to improve upon as a society is to actually ed educate people, but not in a patronising way. People living in tenements uh, generally have to appreciate that uh, they have that joint responsibility for all the common areas in the building, something that Daniel Johnson touched upon in his comments, and whether or not they are actually directly affected by any problems or issues. And at the working group, obviously, there was much discussion regarding the issue of the sinking funds, which residents pay into, so there's already that pot of money available uh, when a repair is needed. Now, now whilst uh, I accept, and I'm sure others will as well, that uh, this will make monthly bills a, a bit higher, it could certainly guard against that big one-off bill uh, to ensure that maintenance takes place before issues become emergency repairs and actually cost even more money. Now, the report by the working group uh, obviously made the three recommendations on the sinking fund also being one of them. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased that uh, the minister, when he uh, uh, opened earlier on, uh, he indicated that the government, Scottish government are going to consider also the report and come back with a, uh, a full and detailed uh, statement later in the year. Uh, certainly, for me, the, the first of the, the recommendations, the, the building inspections, uh, I think is really important. Um, I do think there are certainly some challenges there. Because one of the, uh, the questions for me is, is also that to have them to happen every five years, I think, is, uh, is right. But at the same time, uh, do we actually have enough people uh, trained uh, in that area of expertise to go and deliver this check every five years? I think that's uh, it's certainly something that we do need to fully consider. The second recommendation being the, the, own, the introduction of the owners' associations for tenements. To me, it uh, generally is a very sensible recommendation, and I believe it actually could help foster better relationships between neighbours, something that, that Andy Whiteman touched upon a few moments ago as well. Uh, certainly sometimes constituents have strained relationships with neighbours, uh, or those who are dealing with a neighbour who simply will not engage in repair talks, often contact me, and owners' associations, imagine, would actually force absentee landlords to engage as well. Uh, I, me I mentioned a few moments ago regarding the issue of the sinking funds. Uh, and uh, I know certainly from my constituent who contacted me recently, uh, they are now thinking about just leaving because of the trouble they've actually got uh, uh, with, uh, with some of their neighbours in their particular block. And the sinking fund, although that would certainly help, but I think the, the actual owners association would probably help in that situation as well. But uh, generally, uh, I am conscious of the time sending officer, so I, I do want to say uh, I generally welcome uh, this uh, report. Uh, I'm pleased to play even kind of a small part of actually this report going forward. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that the fact that there is cross-party uh, support on this particular issue, I think indicates how important I think all the parties in the Parliament actually take this particular issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst, to be followed by Polly McNeill. Mr Lindhurst, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a member of the Cross-Party Working Group, I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate. Now, may I begin, as others have, by thanking my colleagues for their excellent work on this vital report. Um, I won't name them all, others have done so, but may I also thank the Minister for citing Grotius, who is a much neglected source of legal wisdom these days. Now, I don't know what Grotius had to say about subdivided mansions that Daniel Johnson's mentioned, but I'm sure Daniel Johnson can research that uh, for himself at some point. Now, um, 
As someone representing Edinburgh and the wider Lothians region, um, I am acutely aware of how many tenement buildings there are in, in this area. They play a vital part in our history and not just our housing needs. And in fact, I was trying to think whether one needed to make a declaration of interest as a, a dweller than myself in one of these buildings. But uh, I think uh, people can simply look at the register of interest for anyone who's spoken in this debate since we all have to live somewhere. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, many of uh, these have fallen into a state of disrepair, and that is why it is absolutely vital that the recommendations in this report are heeded. Under modern conditions, there is, in my view, no effective mechanism in Scotland to ensure the maintenance of tenements is carried out, far less to the appropriate standard. And as a result, it is left up to individuals often to sort the works out themselves, and indeed, usually one proprietor carries the burden of organizing these. That is whether one is living in an Edinburgh tenement of six or 16 in a block, it can be extremely hard to get everyone together to agree to works that may be desperately needed. A wide variety of people may live in these flats for different reasons and many are not themselves owners. Factoring has been referred to by my colleague Graham Simpson and that can be an option, but uh, there is no legal obligation at present unless that is set out in the title deeds. And even then, it may prove difficult to enforce such conditions. With almost 70% of pre-1919 dwellings facing a state of critical disrepair, we are at a crucial point in the life of such tenements. The necessity of reintroducing a binding system, I think, is clear to all. Compulsory, housing, uh, sorry, compulsory owners associations being set up to help with these essential upkeeps and maintenance of tenements is the solution that has been suggested. Such associations would be able to enter into legal contracts, giving them far greater effectiveness. Being able to sing from the same hymn sheet like a choir, rather than an individual having to take legal responsibility for the whole of what can be very costly and substantial works. Preventing apathetic owners from holding up repairs which may be urgently required is also crucial. Now, I think it's been pointed out this, this may not be easy, it may not happen overnight, but today's debate heralds a very important step forward for thousands of people in Edinburgh and across Scotland as a whole. And that is why the working group has called on the Scottish Government to take forward plans to enshrine many of the recommendations into law by 2025, and that it would be helpful if the Government can clarify the timetable that it we'd like to work to on this issue. I appreciate the Minister has made some commitments already in his opening statement. So to conclude, it is a, a crying shame what has happened to many of our vibrant and iconic tenements and dwellings, but it has been a real privilege to be able to be part of this cross-party working group, and I hope we will be able to continue to change matters for the better by agreement when it comes to housing repairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by John Mason. Ms McNeill, please. Thank you very much. There's no Latin in my speech. If you hear any, it's by mistake. Um, so I, I first of all want to, thanks to say thanks to the working group for their hard work, Daniel Johnson, Ben McPherson, Graham Simpson and Andy Whiteman, because it is quite unusual, actually, in this parliament that we have process outside the committees, and I think it's one that should be adopted, so I have to say well done to everyone for doing that. The 2006 Tenement Act was a good act, but it clearly does need to be looked at and reformed. Uh, like other members, I have experience of living in tenement buildings in the West End of Glasgow from 1999 to 2002, and whilst I loved a large spacious rooms, the cornices. Um, I didn't like so much the issues of dry rot, roof repairs and leaks. Um, but these are the things that if you live in a tenement building, um, you have to contend with. It's excellent if you have good neighbours and everyone's on board, but often, I, I've certainly found that's not always the case. There's always either someone who has a difficulty of getting involved um, and can hold up the whole progress of any, any works. So we can't ignore it as a policy issue. 24% of Scotland's housing stock is a tenement. 29% of that was built before 1919. Uh, so that's 7% of all stock. 36% uh, 
uh, of buildings which are in critical or urgent need of disrepair in the tenement sector compared to 24%. So you can see that it's disproportionately high. As the Minister says, we can't ignore it also because uh, tackling um, global climate change and our targets in fuel poverty mean that we can't ignore the issues in tenement properties and flatted dwellings. So to achieve this, we do need to make it simpler, more affordable to owners um, who have to improve their poverty in the short and the long term if we have to meet these targets. Um, I think it was Gordon Lindhurst and Stuart McMillan that said that many owners don't always appreciate the full extent of the repairs within their own property. And often that could have been built over a very long period of time. Uh, I know many owners have found themselves in that situation. Perhaps the, since the introduction of the Home Report, that may have changed because there's more information available. But we've got to make sure that in going forward that we don't land the current owner with all of the bills that have been built over a longer period of time leading to the building being in disrepair. Um, the common repair management uh, is, is not, it's not easy where there's not a factor. Uh, getting together with your neighbours um, is the essential way in which you try and tackle that. And Graham Simpson is quite right to say that dealing with repairs and how to pay for them can affect your mental health going forward because you're trying to deal with your neighbours. You might have little experience of that, but it's affecting your health in um, tra trying to deal with a leaking roof and get your neighbours to agree to pay up. Um, I just wanted to mention the issue of windows because in the west end of Glasgow, we've got the problem of the issue of tenement property in conservation areas where we still haven't found a solution yet for people who need to replace their windows but not spend an absolute fortune replacing them in areas of conservation. I know many owners would really like a scheme to be able to, to do that. Absentee owners is a serious barrier to progress, so we must have obligations placed on absentee owners to ensure that others can manage and keep up the maintenance. Uh, just in conclusion, presiding officer, um, just on the recommendations, the five-year MOT on buildings seems a good idea. Of course, it all depends uh, what that means for the owners, mainly in relation to costs. So I suppose we need to examine the detail of that. Um, compulsory residence associations seems to me the only way in which we can make the management of tenement buildings easier and more comprehensive. Uh, owners of each individual properties can't avoid the fact that they share parts or common areas within the same building. It seems that compulsory residence associations would have to be a baseline for that. I just wanted to ask... No, you um, can't, I'm afraid. I want I'll to leave time for the mesh statement. I don't want to eat into that at all. That, that's fine. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, I call John Mason, followed by Annie Wills. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to take part in this uh, debate today and mark the launch of this report. As I think others have said already today, this is a difficult subject and it's not going to be easy to sort, but it's something that we really do need to address. Many of us and our constituents are living in flats, tenements, four in a block, which are not being properly maintained and have possibly not been properly maintained for many years. In my own case, our estate of some 270 flats were built some 60 years ago as part of Greater Easter House and then had a major refurbishment around 1989, with whole floors removed and entirely new roofs put on. However, that was some 30 years ago. I myself have lived there 29 years. And in most cases, the roofs have not been inspected during that time. Routine maintenance has not been carried out, even gutter cleaning. And you can just see the whole estate gradually deteriorating. We do have factors in place, and I've no complaint against them, but their hands are tied if the owners do not pay for maintenance. And of course, I have constituents in much worse conditions in much older properties. And of course, there is a safety angle to all of this eh, with the possibility of stone or slates falling off roofs as Daniel Johnson graphically described, not to mention electrical dangers and the possibility of fires as Electrical Safety First were reminding us in their briefing. On the other hand, there are tenement properties in very good condition including modern, post-war, and older standstone stock. That is often because they are owned by housing associations who take part of the rent each month and set it aside for planned and cyclical maintenance. So when painting or gutter cleaning or even a new roof is required, there is a fund sitting there ready and available. So my question is, can we learn from what is happening in housing associations and come up with a system that will work for all flat owners? 
It seems to me that this is what this report is suggesting with its three proposals, building inspections, owners associations and reserve funds. And this is not only good uh, for the good of the individual owners or their, and or their families, this is a national problem and we need a national solution. Much of our housing stock has been there for 100 years, as Andy Whiteman was saying, and there really should be no reason that, that it cannot still be there in another 100 years. It is a national asset and gives our towns and cities their distinctiveness. So as I said at the beginning, this is not an easy subject, but the problem impacts both on individuals and on the whole country. Taking these measures may well not be popular, especially if owners have to put aside money each month for maintenance. And the reality is that it will cut into spending on other things, be that holidays, new furniture, or whatever. Now, there absolutely is a valid question about what happens to people who have no available cash to start saving. That is a real challenge. But I believe there are a fair number of people, some have said 80%, who could afford to maintain their buildings, but are just needing a better and simpler system in order to do so. If we can bring in that better system for these people, then we can look at what extra help the minority would need. That certainly applies in a constituency like mine, which does have a lot of high, uh, does have a lot of high quality properties, but also has many properties worth less than £100,000 and some worth not anything at all. Grants will continue to have to play a part, but I also think we will have to look at imaginative solutions, such as interest-free loans, which are only repayable when a property is sold. However, for today, we are focusing on a better system. Other countries have in place the kind of suggestions we are making, building inspections, owners' associations, and reserve funds. So I thank those very much who have done the real work for this report, and I'm very pleased to associate myself with it and to support its recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Maureen Watt. Ms. Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As an MSP for Glasgow, it will come as no surprise I'm speaking in today's debate on tenement maintenance. Glasgow is famed for its tenements as part of the city's fabric since the 19th century. To live in one is to be immersed in Glasgow's rich history. Rather amazingly, around 73% of Glaswegians live in a flat of some description, compared with under 25% for comparable cities in England and Wales. The importance of this debate, therefore, cannot be underestimated, and for that reason, I want to put on, thanks, I, I want to put on record my thanks to the working group um, itself for all the hard work it has put into highlighting this issue. We've known for some time the problems facing Glasgow's tenements. Last year, a report revealed that thousands of Glasgow's closes are in critical disrepair. It was estimated that around 46,000 tenement flats built before 1919 were now dangerous and required major structural weather tightening and restoration work. The cost of this work came to just under £3 billion. That is a substantial figure, and concerningly, this is just Glasgow. Across Scotland, there are nearly 600,000 tenement properties, equating to 24% of Scotland's total housing stock. And alarmingly, 68% of all dwellings have some degree of disrepair, however minor it might be. In Glasgow, the main areas of concern are Govan Hill, Ibrox, Cessnock, East Pollock Shields, Strathbungo, Hag Hill and Deniston. I understand that the Council is in the process of carrying out condition surveys of around 500 pre-1919 tenement properties across the city before it publishes another report in November. Whilst this hopefully will kickstart the beginnings of a longer term plan for the city, the Working Group on Tenement Maintenance set up last year has already set out a number of recommendations. And as I've heard the, these recommendations, the Scottish Government can action and I hope they do. And I wish to I welcome the Minister's commitment to come back to the Chamber later in the year. Currently, individuals are being left to themselves to sort the work out, and that's where we're seeing, an, uh, on a mass scale, its tenements left to deteriorate beyond repair. And as we've also heard, it's called for regular building inspections every five years and a publicly available report. This would allow existing and prospective owners and tenants to know what condition the building is in and what future expenditure might be expected. It also called for the establishment of compulsory owners associations to provide leadership, effective decision-making processes, and the ability of groups to enter into contracts with building professionals. And finally, 
as we've heard, it's called for the establishment of building reserve funds, held centrally with guidelines set as to how much buildings need to contribute depending on the, the age of the building and the building type. The Scottish Conservatives support all of these recommendations and support the working group's call for legislation to put, put forward to Parliament by 2025. That will enshrine the responsibilities of tenement maintenance into law. The Scottish Government needs to take decisive action to protect our built environment and to take forward the recommendations of the working group. Presiding officer, I was told three years ago during my first tour of the Scottish Parliament that the MSPs had their offices in a building that represented, through its architecture, a tenement building. It is therefore with a hint of irony that we have buried our heads in the sand for so long when it comes to addressing the scale of the problem. If we are serious about bringing tenement buildings across Scotland back into livable conditions, then we have to take forward the recommendations of the working group. To not give this issue urgent attention, we'll be letting down thousands of people who this problem affects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Maureen Watt, then closing speeches. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And I too am pleased to be taking part in this debate, having attended all the meetings of the working group on tenement maintenance. September, uh, since September last year uh, when I was eligible to join, although I understand the meetings started in March. And I've been very impressed by the professional and talented experience on the group, the way these folk in subgroups have taken forward different strands of work very quickly, effectively and efficiently. And I too would like to thank Ewan Leach of Built Environment Forum Scotland for providing the Secretariat the academics, including Douglas Robertson, for their input, and to Graham, System, Graham Simpson in the way he's chivied along the work. I joined the group because I love the wonderful granite tenements in my and the minister's constituencies, which look absolutely majestic in the sun, but deeply grey in the rain, but inside and out, are in need of a great deal of TLC. It's not only these, but more recent council housing which require uh, um, attention and where properties have been sold on. And these form a large part of the 900,000 households across Scotland that fall under the Tenement Scotland Act 2004. As I said, the occupation of these homes falls under various ownership, council ownership, owner-occupiers, long-term tenants, and sometimes very absent landlords. And it's very difficult, as we know, to get agreement on doing repairs. I also think many people who purchase a house do not un uh, remember that, as well as including paying mortgage or rent, mortgage particularly, that they will be required uh, to maintain their property. And I think sometimes lawyers or selling agents are amiss in uh, really telling uh, people what is involved in buying particular properties. And like other MSPs, I've had a fair number of cases of constituents, whether they've been homeowners or tenants in private property or in council-owned properties whose homes are requiring major repair. And indeed, despite the, major, the missing share of availability, some councils have not been as good as others in using it. And I hope many councils will learn from Edinburgh on how this should be done. Private owners, too, I do think in many cases, have legitimate serious concerns about the costs put forward by the council in particular, which are sometimes much more than the estimates the owners themselves have got for that work. <coughs> and this is why I think owners associations are really important. And I hope when we get down to the detail of those, that they include all those residents in the building. And if they wish to be involved, tenant, tenants too, because I think if they keep up their properties and feel a bit of responsibility in maintaining the block in good order, it will avoid the building falling into disrepair. So I think owners associations should become a given in new blocks 
uh, and that they should have sinking funds so that we begin to see the benefits that can be drawn from having an association and the sinking funds and that people in other areas will see that where owners voluntarily come together um, and I think that might happen in other areas like the areas that um, Daniel Johnson has mentioned or in the new town um, that where people come together in voluntary organisations, it's infinitely preferable to compulsory uh, um, associations or indeed compulsory factoring, which, as we know, can be um, especially fraught. And I have several instances of where it is fraught, especially... Uh, and there you must end, ground being maintenance. fraught. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, presiding Close officer. Daniel Johnson, close for Labour, please. Thank you. Um, I think there's been a, a great number of contributions. What I think is uh, notable is how much agreement there is in the chamber. So I don't propose to rehearse any of the arguments, but let me maybe emphasise what I think the key points are for the Minister, bearing in mind his statement in the autumn. There are three simple propositions behind what we are talking about, that we should check our buildings, that we should provide owners in common with a mechanism for making agreements and coming to co-decisions, and that the people who co-own buildings should save together. These are three simple ideas, but vitally important ones for maintaining our uh, housing stock in this country. The key issue we have, I believe, is getting it going. I believe once we establish these mechanisms, we set the expectation that this is what we expect when we own tenemented property, that it will reinforce itself, that simply the culture will change, the expectation will change, and this is something that will simply happen. So the question is, how do we get it going? So coming to the first point, building checks, I think we now have a, a system in place with home reports where people expect to see a home report when they buy a house. I think the same thing will come true of the tenement building check, the so-called building MOT, that simply people will not be prepared to buy a tenemented property if that is not in place. If we can establish that, I think that it will take hold. Likewise, owners' associations. I think this is possibly the most difficult bit. But again, that expectation that that is put in place. I think this is one area where the government will need to give some thought about making it easy for owners' associations to be set up, whether that is off-the-shelf articles of incorporation, um, uh, publicity schemes to promote their use. But ultimately, when building works are needing done, if those mechanisms are there and on the shelf, Building owners, co-owners, will reach for them because it will make those decisions easy. And likewise, sinking funds. I think we will need to make them mandatory, and that will be difficult. But again, the missing share scheme, I think, points to uh, how that can be made to work. Where if, if that is not in place, that those funds are claimed back at the point of sale, and that will be popular, but it will make it work. And indeed, I think there are other examples elsewhere in the world where this has been made to work, where these systems and these mechanisms haven't been in place, but they've put them in place, such as Ireland, where multi-user uh, developments were introduced in 2011, and sinking funds were established on a simple 200 euro per annum fee just to get them going. These are the sorts of things that we will need to look at in Scotland, because I think that we can, and indeed we must, because we have been here before. And indeed the, the Labour Lib Dem administration consulted on these self-same proposals back in 2003 but decided it was too difficult. I don't think we can come to that conclusion this time. Yes, it is difficult, so I urge the government to have courage, but I think we need to in order to preserve our housing stock. And I would urge the other parties to join the consensus, because if we make this something of common and collective interest, something that we, we recognise as difficult, so we must stand shoulder to shoulder, then we will make it happen, and our housing stock will be the better for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I call on Jeremy Balfour to close to the Conservatives, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and can I again uh, thank uh, the Government and the Minister for making time for this debate and for all the contributions um, that have come from across the Chamber. The Scottish Parliament Working Group on Tenement Rights, which I have been proud to serve on as a member, was formed in March 2018, and it was set out to find common themes on how to improve legislation in this area. And quite remarkably, we actually did find common themes that had cross-party support, and perhaps even more importantly than that, had support uh, from the experts 
in the field. And I think that, if you like, is the strength of this report, as speakers have mentioned earlier, that we have not only got cross-party support from, well, four of the five parties, we're not quite sure uh, where the Lib Dems are, but hopefully they will uh, appear at some point. But more important than that, uh, we have uh, the buy-in of the professionals and from local authorities as well. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, thank um, Ben McPherson for winning the debate uh, a couple of years ago. And the reason I took part in that debate when it first came up was from my um, rather troubled experience as a local councillor here in Edinburgh. Um, I was pleased that I think Maureen Watt said how good Edinburgh was as a model. If you'd come here a few years ago, uh, it might have not been quite that experience. And we went through a difficult time as a local authority and how we should deal with tenements. But I think the council has learned from that. And I think it has shown that we can move forward together um, and we do need to work on that. Uh, everyone, I think, has mentioned the three recommendations and I'm, I will not uh, go through them again uh, to save time, Deputy President Officer. But I think John Mason was right um, in his comments when he said, the difficulty will not be agreeing the principles, but it's how we will implement it in practice. And I think Daniel Johnson and others also picked up on that point. And I think that will be the challenge uh, for the minister and for the government when they come back with the autumn statement is yes, we can agree broad terminology, we can agree uh, broad uh, principles, but when it comes down to actually um, how we do it and the amount of money that will be involved, I suspect that is when we will have to work very closely together. And then beyond that, how do we sell it to our constituents um, where they will have to pay extra, as has been pointed out by other speakers? I think it is important, Deputy Presiding Officer, to uh, make the point that Graeme Simpson uh, started with, and that this is not just an issue for Aberdeen, or for Edinburgh, or for Glasgow. It's an issue for lots of cities and towns throughout Scotland, because tenements exist, uh, not just those from 100 years ago, but actually those from post-war and even more recent. And I do think we have to look at what are we going to do with uh, tenements and, and flats that are built uh, today. Um, I know many people now have factors, and I do think that is a way forward. And I think it is a, a question of whether we need to look further about how do we encourage or even perhaps force uh, owners to have some kind of factoring within their block. Uh, can I, again, in conclusion, Deputy President Officer, uh, thank all those uh, who did the hard work, um, and particular to uh, Ben McPherson and to Graham Simpson, who have chaired this meeting. We have set ourselves a target of 2025. That is the, the date we want to see these things implemented. That may seem a long way away for some of us, but actually the hard work now starts. And I know on this side, and I'm sure across the whole of this chamber, we look forward to uh, not only hearing the, the Minister summing up now, but perhaps more importantly, what he will say uh, come the autumn. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Kevin Stewart. Close to the Government Minister, please. How long have I got, President Officer? Six minutes. Six minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of the members that have uh, taken part in today's debate. Um, I think that the common ground on the uh, points that issue is reflected in the joint motion and in the consensus that there has been uh, this afternoon uh, between members of the parliament and all of the main points. Uh, and there have been uh, many uh, points uh, raised. Um, and first of all, I think one of the things that we must do as we move forward is to make sure that we get the definition of a tenement block absolutely right. Because um, as Mr. Balfour has said at the very end, it's not just uh, those blocks that are built in the 19th and early 20th centuries. We're talking about buildings that are still being constructed um, today. Um, and tenements are uh, a, a building which comprises two or more flats, uh, which are designed to be in separate ownership. 
uh, and divided from each other horizontally according to the Tenement Scotland Act 2004 and that uh, may include some divided mansions although uh, not many of them exist in my own constituency as to be said Mr Johnson. Um, I know from my own casework um, the problems uh, that can be caused with common ownership and uh, trying to get uh, repairs. It's very, very frustrating uh, for owners uh, who accept their responsibilities and are keen to get things done uh, to find that some of the others in their block um, are not so willing to do so. Um, and I think a number of members, including uh, Pauline McNeill and I think Andy Whiteman, uh, said that these things often lead to real problems in terms of mental health. So it's not just the cost of, uh, uh, of, of doing the work that's necessary, it's the human cost of not doing the work. And I've come across this um, time and time again um, in Aberdeen where people uh, have been worn down uh, by the fact that they kind of get traction um, or in dealing with a, a difficulty. Um, we all agree uh, that we want to preserve our tenements uh, for the future. Uh, and I think we all agree in the scale of the task that is involved. Um, there will, of course, always be um, uh, disagreements on the detail on, and the timing on how we progress. And Mr. Uh, Lindhurst asked me a, a, about timing, and I'm not going to give uh, a, an answer to that. Uh, what I will do is give that sus substantive response uh, in the autumn, as I've said. I think it would be uh, uh, wrong for any of us uh, to lay out a timetable about how uh, we move, move forward. It would be wrong for any of us, I think, to say exactly how we're going to move forward because it may well be that we have to do some of this incrementally um, and we need to look at what is required in terms of any changes in secondary uh, legislation and regulation and what in all of this will require primary legislation. And it is always very difficult uh, to give timescales um, when it comes to that kind of thing. Uh, but I will reiterate what I said, that I will uh, provide a, a substantive uh, response uh, in the autumn. Uh, it seems that some folk now think that that is a statement. That is not something I've agreed with the uh, Minister for Parliament. So I may have to go back and have the conversation with him uh, around about that. But the substantive uh, response uh, will come in the autumn. I want to touch upon uh, a couple of things in my, my final uh, couple of minutes, and that is around about the existing powers, um, because there are existing powers to help folks out there. Now, I was frustrated myself about Aberdeen City Council uh, and its lack of use of missing, missing share powers. That has changed. They are now using missing share powers. That is of great relief to me. It's of great relief to my constituents. And what I would like to know from members, as I've said before, is where they are finding difficulties um, in their own patches. Uh, and I wonder if I can be helpful in terms of cajoling some of the councils uh, to move forward. Uh, I've also spoken uh, previously uh, around about some of the schemes that we have in place in terms of helping folk, including um, the equity share scheme that we're piloting uh, in a number of local authorities. I'm keen uh, to look at rolling that out uh, across the country, which I think can make a, a real difference um, in helping folk access the finance that they may need uh, to make the repairs um, in their uh, properties. Uh, President officer, um, Mr Whiteman uh, said that uh, we're grappling with complex questions here. Um, and I think that is very fair to say. This is an extremely complex issue, issue, and as Mr. Johnson pointed out, it's an issue that Parliament has looked at previously um, and kind of copped out of. Um, what I would say is that none of us um, can afford to do what happened uh, in the early 2000s. Um, some of this may take a bit of time. Uh, it may take 10, 15, 20 years to get all of this right. Uh, but I think that the work that has gone on in the working group um, and the responses that we have seen shows that we cannot ignore this. Now, we will have to explain uh, exactly how we are going to move forward in this front. Uh, and there may be disagreement, as I said, around about some of the particulars of that. But ignore this, we cannot. Uh, and I hope that we can continue uh, with the consensus that we've had today uh, as we move forward. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much.
That concludes the debate on the working group on tenement maintenance. It is time to move on to the next item of business. I'll have a few seconds at the front benches to take their places for the statement.